this set of notes is about the different groups of uh, chordates, which includes the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And so there's a chart that I'll give you about the vertebrates to fill in with this if there's not a chart in your packet. Um, but there are a couple of worksheets that we'll talk about in class based on some of the groups in this, in this particular phylum. The phylum chordata, remember, uh, all members have a notochord, pharyngeal pouches, a dorsal nerve cord, and a post-anal tail. Um, and this is a diagram of just a generalized chordate. Remember that some chordates have all these features in their adult life. Others have them only as an embryo stage. Uh, now, there are a couple of groups of invertebrate chordates, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them. Uh, they belong to phylum, there are, there are two, they're, they're a subphylum or a smaller phylum, Eurochordata, which are tunicates or sea squirts, and they have, um, they have the characteristics of the um, chordate in their uh, larva form, but not in the adult form. In the adult form, they don't look anything like an, um, a chordate. They don't even much look like an animal. They look more similar to, I guess, something like a sponge or if nothing else, but they're very small. They're about an inch or so in uh, total overall length from the bottom to the top, and um, they are filter feeders. They filter stuff out of the water, but they are chordates. They do have the characteristics of chordates in their larva form. The other group is the uh, cephalochordata, which are the um, lancelets, and they kind of look like tiny little fish-like uh, animals, but they burrow down into the sand, and they... And they, again, they filter stuff out of the water with their mouth. They do look more like a chordate as far as having the structures in their adult form. But we're not going to spend really any time talking about these, and you will not be tested on them either. Uh, the vertebrate chordates include uh, several groups of fishes. There are three different classes of fishes. When I use the term fishes, I'm talking about different groups of fishes rather than individual uh, group, an individual school of fish or something like that. So when you see here, fishes that usually talk about the different groups like the drawless fishes and the cartilage fishes and the bony fishes. But then with each within each one you usually use the term fish to refer to the plural. So we have three classes of fishes. We have the agnatha, which are the jawless fishes that include things like hagfish and lampreys. Um, they do have cartilage skeleton, no jaws and no fins. They just have kind of an open mouth. Um, they're they're parasites. They attach to other fish or other things, or like whales and other things that live in the ocean, and they just suck their blood to get their nutrition. Their respiratory system includes gills to filter the water out of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, oxygen out of the water and dispose of carbon dioxide from it. They have a six parts or six pumping parts of their circulatory system, but the circulatory system is open circulatory system, more like some of the invertebrates than the other vertebrates. The chondrichthys, or the cartilage fish, include sharks, rays, and skate. They have a skeletal system made of cartilage. They do have jaws and fins, and that they can swim around. They have they use gills to do their um, gas exchange in the water. They have a two-chambered heart, and it's a single-loop system, and we'll talk about circulatory systems and about gut body systems next week. Uh, the third group is the osteichthys. Um, this is the bony fishes, and this is most of the fish that you know anything about, tuna, trout, catfish, perch, um, bass, any of the kind of fish that you normally have any dealings with. They have a skeletal system made of bone. They do have jaws, and they have bony rays in their fins. They also have gills that allows for their oxygen exchange, but their gills are covered by a, 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 a gill cover called an operculum, whereas the um, agnatha and the chondrichthys have open gills. The... Um, Bony fish also have a two-chambered heart. They have the single-loop circulatory system. Uh, here's a picture of hagfish and lampreys, which are the main um, examples of the agnatha, no jaws. They just have kind of an open mouth here with um, kind of a rasping kind of teeth, and it kind of forms a suction on the uh, host. Uh, the cartilage fish, of course, sharks and, and rays are the ones that are, you know, we're most familiar with. And the bony fish, any kind of other fish that you see, are usually bony fish. The next groups of vertebrates are the amphibians and the reptiles. Um, examples of amphibians would be frogs, newts, and salamanders. They have smooth skin with no nails or claws. Um, as tadpoles, they have gills to, for their oxygen or for their gas exchange. And the, the frogs 
um, and most salamanders as adults have lungs. There are some salamanders that maintain their yield throughout their life, but it's more common for them to have lungs. They have a three-chambered heart with a double-loop circulatory system, and we will, again, next week, we will spend more time talking about the body systems and why this is the significant departure from or advance from the single-loop system that the fishes have. Reptiles, snakes, lizards, crocodiles, and other kinds of reptiles have scaly skin and do have claws on their, on their, on their um, digits. They use lungs for respiration. They have a three-chambered or a four-chambered heart, depending on which group they belong to. And they also have the double-loop circulatory system. Again, we'll talk about the significance of this next week. Uh, amphibians, of course, include salamanders and frogs. We're most familiar with frogs as amphibians, but they're salamanders as well. The life cycle of amphibians depends on water. They have to have they have to lay their eggs in water because their eggs have no shells and they will dry out otherwise. They also undergo metamorphosis. That means that they go from a, an aquatic tadpole that breathes using gills into an air-breathing frog. And uh, they undergo these changes over time based on hormonal changes in their bodies. Reptiles spend their entire life cycle on land. And they're able to do this because they have developed something called an amniotic egg. The egg of reptiles has a leathery shell um, that helps protect it from the elements. And this was a big uh, important factor in the adaptive radiation of reptiles um, away from water because they were able to move away from water and take advantage of habitats that were inland away from the oceans and uh, lakes and rivers. They also have internal fertilization. Now some fishes have internal fertilization also. Um, frogs have external fertilization. But internal fertilization means that the male deposits the sperm inside the body of the female where fertilization occurs rather than both the eggs and the sperm being released into um, outside the body before they come in contact with each other. Uh, here's a picture of an amniotic egg that shows you, this is a bird egg, but it shows you the basic structures that are present there. Uh, you don't need to know about the different layers. It just shows that the embryo is enclosed in these different layers that nourish it and collect waste and so forth. And also the shell, which protects it from the environment so that it can develop outside the body away from water. Now, when we talk about the, the uh, structures of the heart, this shows an example of a three-chambered heart, or almost four-chambered heart, of a turtle. Uh, uh, there are two pumping chambers, the eight right atrium and the left atrium, and one ventricle with an incomplete division. And what this means is there is mixing of the oxygen-rich blood from the lungs and the oxygen-poor blood from the body before it's distributed to the rest of the body. So it's not quite as efficient as the mammal's four-chambered heart. And we'll, again, we'll talk more about this next week. The next class of vertebrates is the aves, or the birds. Birds actually are kind of an offshoot of the reptile branch. They evolved from reptiles. Um, some of the dinosaurs, the, um, if you learned anything about dinosaurs when you were younger, there are the lizard hip dinosaurs, the saurischians, and the bird hip dinosaurs, or the ornithischians. And they have different kinds of structures, and the ornithischians evolved into the present day birds. Birds have scaly legs with claws. They have a beak, no teeth, and they have wings with feathers rather than scales. The feathers are a modification for flight. Most birds can fly. All birds have feathers. Their heart has four chambers. It has a double loop circulatory system, and they are endothermic, meaning that they um, generate their own body heat. All of the other groups that we've talked about before this point are, in, are exothermic. That means they depend the outside conditions or the exterior conditions that determine their body temperature. Birds are unique in that they have lungs with extra air sacs and they have one way flow through ventilation from the nose to through the air sacs. They have internal fertilization and they produce amniotic eggs with shells. And we have all different kinds of birds from the flightless penguins to the peacock with its huge tail feathers for demonstration uh, demonstrating its um, desirability to the females. We have all kinds of courting rituals that occur in birds, various other kinds of things, lots of variety in the bird class. And the last class of, of um, vertebrates is class mammalia. 
Uh, the mammals have mammary glands to feed milk to their young. They have fur or hair. They have subcutaneous fat, which helps keep them warm. They have a four-chambered heart and are also endothermic. And there are three different groups of mammals based upon their method of reproduction. There are the monotremes, which are egg layers, which includes the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater. The marsupials, which have pouches, um, and they give birth to very immature young that complete their development outside the, the uterus in the mother's pouch. This includes the kangaroo, the possum, and a number of other species. And the placentals, which includes lions and tigers and bears, cougars, of course, and man. Now, worksheets in your packet that we will complete in class include the reptile activity, which is about um, it's a graphing activity that we'll do in class and some information about reptiles. And then we have a worksheet comparing birds and mammals where you'll look at the characteristics of birds and mammals and compare them. And a third one that is the three groups of mammals that will compare the three different these monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. That completes the notes on kingdom animalia.